model or a paradigm to improve your surfing performance. Welcome to the Surf Mastery Podcast. We interview the world's best surfers and the people behind them to provide you with education and inspiration to surf better. Welcome to the Surf Mastery Podcast. Today's guest is Richard Bennett. Richard is a surfer from Australia and Richard is also a psychologist, performance psychologist I should say. Richard got his Bachelor of Arts extended major in psychology in 1994, went on to do an honours degree in psychology. Loads of other qualifications I could read out, but I'll just keep it relevant. Richard was the surf psychologist for the World Surf League between 2000 and 2003, author of The Surfer's Mind, which is an awesome resource. Uh, Richard has also done a lot of uh, psychology work with Olympic and Commonwealth teams in Australia. Uh, I could go on, but I won't, Richard, because that's an impressive, an impressive list of roles and qualifications you've got. But tell me, Richard, how and why did you get into psychology? Well, when I was very young, Mike, something that I really loved and I still love to this day is music. Uh, I was really uh, mesmerised by you know, Pink Floyd and Jimi Hendrix and, and those kinds of artists a lot because of the actual sound that they produced, but also because they just had such beautiful lyrics and they could paint a picture in your mind with the lyrics of their songs. And, you know, Pink Floyd, The Wall, that's just a whole description of a life experience, you know, beautifully delivered in music. And so for me, I think it just opened my mind to creativity. And when people are being creative, that's when we're at our happiest and when we're fulfilling our potential, whether it's creating a piece of art or creating a piece of performance like surfing a wave. And uh, I think it just grew from there. So I just naturally was drawn to creative people, creative expressions. Of course, the mind produces things spontaneously, which is an element of creativity. And uh, we can do that, I guess, consciously as well, which was uh, another good realisation to have. And then when I got into uni, I had I, I just really got into an arts course, so I had a good opportunity to just choose what I'd like to do, and I thought, well, that's the time. Now's the time to really look at psychology, and I really loved the studies. Um, and more importantly, I loved applying what I was learning to daily life, which is really the most important experience we have uh, when we're learning to master the mind and our, our thinking, our emotional state and our, our behaviours and performance. Were you already a surfer before you studied psychology? Yes, I was very fortunate. Um, my auntie built a beach house down on the Mornington Peninsula, which is where some surf breaks like Cape Shank, Gunnamatta, Portsy, uh, most people might know. And so when I came along, when I was born, uh, we were pretty much all in the water before we could even walk. And uh, just playing in, in the in the in the bay side, and then when we got a little bit older and a little bit more confident, playing in the shore breaks and the waves of Gunnamatta and Portsea, Serena, those kind of places. And but it wasn't until I was about thirteen that I actually got a surfboard. So before that, it was all body surfing, surf mats, and anything else we could get our hands on. And then when I was about thirteen, I, I got a surfboard, and uh, yeah, that was that was really life changing. <laughs> it was just fantastic to be able to stand up and literally have a dance floor on a wave on a dance floor that's already moving. <laughs> so so dur during your study and application of psychology, did you then realize how that was affecting what you did in the water? Yeah, I, I think very early on, you're, you're so, we're so playful as children. We haven't got that conscious awareness that, well, what I'm doing is um, – consciously guiding and creating this movement in the water and things like that but we're just so free and open with it and I think I started to reflect on those experiences because it was almost so much fun I never ever had any fear in the ocean and then when I started to progress my surfing and wanted to challenge myself and that that kind of fear came in I think that was a little bit like well hang on when I was less proficient and I was just playing in the ocean. I didn't have any of this fear experience. So now that I've got knowledge, how can I actually transform that to wisdom so I can have the child's mind as well as the value of the experience and the knowledge? So, yeah, just start to open my mind to thinking, uh, well, quite consciously about my surfing and having a focus and um, particularly when the fear might arise because of the size of the wave or the intensity of the situation. 
Okay, so performance psychology has got a lot to do with reducing fear? Yeah, all, I mean, all psychology uh, has a lot to do with, with understanding fear and, and mastering that uh, divine message that uh, our being produces. And, and sometimes it's produced uh, because of a thought pattern or a belief that we might have had for a while that's no longer serving us. So we want to really transform that and open our potential even further. But other times that uh, message of fear is coming from a deeper part of our being, which is more about uh, self-love and that perhaps the moment, the intensity, the challenge that's before us might be a little bit beyond us. So there's some fears that are really good to challenge and to transcend and it opens up another level of potential and we see that with the world's best big wave riders and then other fears uh, are really from um, our inner being I think and they're a real message of self-love and um, again even in a big wave riding or, or other kind of performance setting if our being is telling us that we're not quite ready for example we might need a better breath hold much better swimming or other capacity that's required to meet the demands better equipment or that the performance space just isn't workable today like the waves aren't makeable, then it's good to honour that fear and uh, respond with love which is uh, maybe do a little more training or wait till it goes offshore tomorrow or the swell drops or something like that. So we're kind of talking about awareness. Yeah, certainly. Keeping surfing out of it for now, how would you define psychology? Uh, I define psychology as life. Because for me, psychology is, uh, it is all about the mind in, as a starting point. And our mind is like our portal between the world around and our inner world. And a, a very practical way that I look at psychology is that it's about the quality of our thoughts, our feelings and our actions or behaviours. So in a performance setting, how we ride the wave or decisions we make in a performance space. And then the other really important uh, element of what psychology is, is it's about relationships. And the first one is the relationship with self. So how we think and feel about ourself, our self-love. And the other relationship that's very important and can in fact be quite infinite as well, is uh, the relationship we have with the people and the world around us. So family, friends, partners, acquaintances, business associates, and then of course the spaces we find ourselves in or we choose to step into, such as the workplace, study space, the ocean, wherever we like to play. Okay. And then what are some key factors in optimizing your psychology when you're surfing? Well, you, you shared it a moment ago, Mike, that awareness. You know, if, if we're not aware we're about something, aware of something, then we don't have the opportunity to respond. And it's a little bit of a balance because, as you can imagine, sometimes when we're not aware of something and we just go by feel, uh, you know, we actually do really well. <laughs> um, and that's a lot of our experiential learning. Uh, but when you're really wanting to take yourself to the full limits or, or maybe not the full limits, just to the full expression of your potential might be a better way to put it and or the full intensity and demand of a challenge that's before you, uh, then you really do want to have an intimate awareness of the self and the inner world. So again, the quality of how I think, feel and choose to respond in this moment and of course an intimate awareness of the world around and so okay if I say it's a big wave situation what are the safe entry and exit spots what are the currents doing what's the tide doing what's the lineup what are the waves that are makeable what are the waves that are not makeable what are my lineups for my takeoff positioning what's my exit strategy if all things go uh, pear-shaped so to, to, to a point, uh, not having awareness can be very playful and spontaneous, but uh, once you're really wanting to consciously optimise your potential in a performance space, uh, awareness, which is, you've probably heard the term, people would have heard the term mindfulness, you know, for me that's basically what mindfulness is, it's simply good awareness, clear awareness of self, your inner world and uh, the world around. So are we kind of talking about living in the moment? Well, the moment is where everything happens <laughs> and it's also the space of time where we do have command to uh, create change and, uh, or to really uh, zero in on a focus. So, for example, the past, once something's happened, we can't really change that but we can certainly learn from it and bring that learning into the moment to improve our focus, 
improve our feeling or the delivery, the execution of our actions or performance. And then, of course, the future can be a wonderful, rich space that drives a lot of love and energy. For example, I'm going to the Mentorize in September this year and I've started my training program for that and I just picked up my first of three boards. And so, you know, the future can be a really wonderful um, energy that when we bring it into the moment, it energizes uh, what we're doing uh, in that moment. But yeah, awareness, whenever we are consciously aware of something, whether it's our breath, whether it's a wave that we've just spotted that we want to catch, whether it's a topic that our friend or girlfriend or someone's just brought up in a conversation, then we're very much in the moment when we have that awareness. So, yeah, they, they certainly go hand in hand. Yeah. Focusing on the past has been an issue for myself, and I see it with a lot of other surfers as well, in that, you know, during a surf, you, you might stuff up a wave that was kind of easily makeable or you mess something up and you paddle back out and it kind of it can almost ruin your surf sometimes have you got any strategies for kind of getting getting over those mistakes quickly yes certainly and with all psychology there's some generic understandings and strategies that are useful when i say generic pretty much uh, anyone as a starting point can start to go, oh, well, okay, that might be something I could try, like a focus strategy or something that adjusts, adjusts your emotional state. But a lot of the work I do with people is uh, highly individualized. So the first thing I do is understand who the human being is and they just happen to be a surfer or they happen to be a, a, an Olympic athlete or a Paralympic athlete. But understanding the human is really where I understand the natural creativities, the natural elements of who they are and how they think that are really going to help in the moment, how they return to the ideal focus and feeling if that was broken by a, a few moments of self-doubt or frustration because they just uh, didn't optimise a wave that came through. But in, in a very basic sense, how we our actual focus, what we're thinking is something that in the moment we can change. And if it's a heat, for example, when you have a strategy for a heat, that's always a good topic for the mind to come back to if it starts to go into doubt or frustration because the last wave you got, which could have been an eight or a nine, you turned into a five. So coming back to your heat strategy, sometimes people come back to affirmations. Okay, I've got this good board. I know my plan is really good for this heat. I'm just going to stick back to my strategy or I'm going to change to plan B because plan A is not working. So that, those things can help. And then I also teach people how to utilize their, their body and their expression to shift their mind, their focus, their feeling. Because as you might be aware, our body and our uh, facial expression is far more communicative than the, than the actual words we say out loud or we say in our mind. Now, of course, words that we say out loud or our self-talk in our mind can have very powerful impact. But when we simply adjust our posture and when we um, transform our facial expression, we start to shift quality of mind and quality of emotional state, which brings us back into the moment. And we've got kind of like a clean slate to choose confidence or choose happiness or choose the feeling that we want to, you know, when the net, that next wave comes, we turn the eight into a 10. Mm, okay. What about yourself personally when you're free surfing? Do you have something that you would bring yourself back to when you're sitting out the back waiting and things? Oh, yeah. I've spent 20 years <laughs> playing around with uh, what goes on in my mind out in the ocean, Mike. And interestingly, how I first began to combine my surfing and my psychology to you know really start growing uh, my understanding and my services in surf psychology was I started to apply the mental strategies and understandings I was using with clients in a clinical setting, in a mental health setting with anxiety and panic to my own fears in bigger waves and in more challenging conditions that I was uh, putting myself in down the far southwest in Victoria. And so... I, that's where things like the self-talk and the body and, and in particularly breathing uh, were really powerful experiences to do in the ocean consciously to create a focus and a feeling. And then my first season in Hawaii uh, was the 2001 winter and I did a research project where I interviewed about 30, 35 of the world's best big wave riders. I did what was called a, a content analysis, which is when you've got a whole group of transcribed interviews you and another researcher independently 
uh, go through and analyze the content and come out with whatever themes continue to resonate. And then uh, you've done that blindly. So when you match how each research has interpreted the, their, their own um, analysis, you can really see themes that are consistent. And one of the questions in those interviews was, what's the best mindset to surf big waves? And, of course, like I was sharing before, the humans can have their own subtleties and nuances. But what that content analysis came down to was what I called the three Cs of big wave riding, the best mindset, which I, I included in my book, The Surfer's Mind. And those three Cs are C for calm, so mentally and physically being very calm and in command of that calm state. Being confident was the second C, confident in self, in your ability to perform, but also your ability to manage any scenario that may uh, come about and then of course confidence in your equipment and then when it was about a support team whether it was toe surfing uh, so your, your, your toe partner or whether it was just the people who are around you to help if uh, you needed that assistance you had that confidence and then the third C was commitment so every decision every action was executed with 100% commitment so even if the decision was I'm not going to go that way then you back that decision 100% and got out of its way. <laughs> and, of course, when you did make the decision to go the way, absolutely no hesitation whatsoever. So for me, I almost felt like I was cheating a bit mentally uh, in my first season in Hawaii because I just had this beautiful opportunity to interview 30 or more of the world's best big wave riders and was very... I was able to very quickly turn the data around to come up with the three Cs. And so I, I drew three Cs on my board, but that was in kind of the shape of three waves together so you know it was just a as well as being um the actual content calm confident and committed it was just a beautiful visual symbol so i didn't really have to think it anymore i just see this symbol and it was on the stringer so uh, up the front of the board so when i was taking off even sometimes i'd see it and i just lock into that mindset when it was a sketchy drop on a big wave at sunset or wyme or somewhere like that okay and what's this so let's start with with calm so you mentioned uh, the way you hold your posture and your and your breathing. Do you have any any advice for people uh, in that regards to keep calm? Yeah, well, I mean, people who are listening now, you could even try it now. If your posture is in a position where muscles have to activate and hold you because your posture is a little awkward, and or quite commonly when we're a little bit nervous or worried, we get tension across the shoulders and the neck. So even if people roll their shoulders back and down and allow the chest to open and come freely uh, uh, forward of the spine, then you, you're already starting to calm yourself and come into a really quite a composed uh, posture, which is going to help the mind also compose as well. And the other thing about both physical and mental calmness, which is uh, a very powerful and simple strategy, is to be mindful of your breath and your breathing style. And how we breathe has a very significant impact on whether we activate or whether we uh, create a real deep sense of calm and serene experience within body and mind. And in a very basic way, when we're really filling the upper thoracic with our breathing, you know, the upper middle lobes of the lungs, a lot of the hard wiring for sympathetic nervous system, which is where fight or flight lives, that's all hardwired up top. So when we're breathing, short and sharp or large and heavy up top with our chest we're actually activating the part of our nervous system that's purpose-built to activate us more whereas if we're uh, uh, breathing below the diaphragm or moving the diaphragm from below that's where a lot of the hard wiring when it relates to breathing a lot of the hard wiring of our parasympathetic nervous system uh, exists and so when you're guiding the movement of the diaphragm for your for your breath from below you'll actually start to create a sense of calm and relaxation within body and mind and once the mind's calm it's a lot clearer and easier to choose responses rather than have thoughts fire off and be reactive yeah so when you're you're calm and relaxed you make better decisions yeah, that's right, and that, that's a big part of mindfulness too. You know, a, a difference between someone who's being mindful and mindless mm. is that the person that's being mindless is whatever stimulation they're presented with, they simply react without thought. And those reactions come from ingrained patterns of thinking or belief about self or the situation. And if they're dysfunctional, then that reaction is going to be dysfunctional. That action is not going to work. Whereas somebody who's mindful the uh, initial thought, because if it's an old pattern, will arise, but the mindful person will observe that and make a choice about whether they respond to that thought or that pattern of thinking or belief or whether they choose a different one. 
Now, there's a good golden rule in a lot of sport, and particularly when it's uh, dangerous situations, is you want to practice all this in training before you implement it in competition. <laughs> in other words, if you're, and, this, and again, this is some of the work I do with people, training people around their mindfulness in a safe space and then introducing that into the danger zones that they might go, along with surfers, I work with extreme athletes in a whole range of pursuits, uh, then you've actually developed that skill before you're implementing it in the high-risk situation. Uh, so, yeah, being able to observe thoughts and choose a response or choose not to respond because a lot of thoughts arise and we just let them fall away and then they don't have an impact, whereas uh, a lot of society conditions us to react to everything. <laughs> so... Uh, it's good to be coming back to how nature designed us to think, which is really absorb with our focus and be conscious and have free choice and free will. Okay, so keep calm and relaxed through, so just a nice relaxed upright body posture and nice relaxed deep rhythmic diaphragmatic breathing could be some, some basic advice for surfers. Yeah, and practicing those experiences, for example, when you're paddling. Because, uh, you know, fear is quite often about the past or the future. In the, I just got smashed on the last wave and I'm paddling back out and I'm all adrenalized and activated, worrying about getting smashed the next one. So that's a beautiful time to get your paddling in rhythm with your breathing and open your mind to that awareness. And then, of course, if the thoughts are out of the future, it's the same thing. Oh, I'm going to get work next wave. Well, you want to come back into the moment. And right now in the moment, you're in the channel paddling, so you're actually not at risk of anything. So being aware of that will help people calm in the moment. Clear the mind. With a clear mind, you're much easier to choose fo ideal focus and feeling. Yeah. And the next C you mentioned was confidence. Yeah, that's right. Can you be too confident, though? Yeah, for me, um, lots of continuums people use are high and low. So you want to. it's probably preferable to be higher on confidence than lower. But for me, when it comes to emotions and not just confidence, all our emotions, happiness, um, you know, contentment, things like that, yes, there's a low end. But for me, I'm more interested in going deeper into the feeling. So I want to have a deeper sense of confidence about myself and my ability to be successful or to manage whatever scenario that I encounter. You know, I want a deeper level of happiness or contentment in life, not so much a higher uh, level of happiness, which might, you know, in a clinical sense might end up being mania, <laughs> you know. So it's a good point that you raise, Mike, because uh, people can become overconfident. And when we're overconfident, we're usually overactivated. Um, at that sympathetic nervous system level. So our, our thoughts are firing off a lot quicker. We might take unnecessary risks. And when the thoughts are racing, the quality of our decision-making tends to drop out as well. But when you're going deeper into a sense of confidence, which is where confidence itself and the thought about it starts to um, dissolve because when you're in a deeper sense, it's more about there's just this profound trust and knowing. So we don't actually have to think about the confidence or generate it anymore because we've gone to that deeper level of just knowing in our being with every cell in our body, every part of our ethereal being that I'm here, I'm in the moment, I'm ready, let's bring it on. You know? Yeah. But on a practical sense, in my book I present the four core elements of performance as uh, a model or a paradigm to improve your surfing performance and it applies to life too but in the confidence situation the four core elements mind body equipment ocean so when you train your body to 100 percent of its potential you're naturally going to feel more confident when you tune your equipment to 100 percent of its potential and to be specific for the performance demands the waves that you're surfing you'll be really confident in your commitment uh, equipment and then when you understand the ocean, you develop an intimate relationship with the ocean and you're very much in tune with the current surf zone that you're intending to surf, well, without even doing a mental strategy, because you've tuned body equipment and the ocean, the mind's very free and open, but you already have a very deep felt sense of confidence. And then, of course, you can have specific strategies that enhance confidence in the moment too, uh, if required. Okay, commitment. That's a big one. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it sure is. And in that space, in that performance space, you know, for me, total commitment to preparation really is the basis for total commitment in the moment. So if I haven't done the work, if I haven't tuned my body, if I haven't tuned my equipment, if I'm not dialed into the ocean, in the moment when that wave comes, if it's a critical situation, an intense situation, my commitment might falter because I haven't demonstrated that commitment through the preparation process. 
And uh, as I was sharing before, commitment you know, is, is uh, 100% go, just 100% go. You know, Eddie would go. <laughs> uh, so there's no hesitation. And it's okay if the go is to go to the channel and not take that wave. And uh, whether it's a big wave setting or a competition setting, you know, when we're, wa- we're all probably watching Fiji recently, and to not go such beautiful, perfect waves. I mean, that's some of the surfers in uh, my book, The Surfer's Mind, talk about that. The challenge, the mental challenge to let good waves go because uh, you're trusting that there's a better one for the actual competitive scenario that's going to offer more points. And um, with J Bay coming up, uh, that's definitely another place where the decision to not go is actually can be a really good one and totally change your heat and your position in the heat. So commitment, that's another thing I noticed, and I'm interested to know if, if you agree. If you commit 100% to a wave and you don't make it, it's actually safer than having that little bit of hes- hesitation and getting caught up in the lip. Do you agree? Yeah, certainly, because uh, quite often that little hesitation is the reason you're caught up in the lip because it was literally one paddle stroke or a half hut of paddle stroke that meant you're now caught in the lip instead of under it and at least, you know, get a rail in and if it's going to close out and not be makeable anyway at least getting out of the way of the lip whether you whether you pull in pull through or you're able to straighten out but you're quite right that that moment of hesitation is what decreases for example the power in your muscles might only be by 20 percent but that might be the fine line between you not getting under the lip and being in the lip um, and of course if there's a, a moment of realization that this is unmakeable uh, when you've got full commitment, you're going to be more relaxed about it because you're just purely in the moment with what's happening. And quite often, we surprise ourselves with what we do make because that thought that comes in might, is not based on reality until reality unfolds. Um, and the other thing is that if it does end up in a wipeout, because we're so in the moment, that's when we're at our most calm and serene. So I'm not worried about the future. Oh, I'm going to drown and not hold my breath enough or, or what happened last time. It's like, okay, you just deal with what's happening right now and uh, most wipeouts are, are pretty brief uh, in relative terms. So Yeah, and, then, and also with small waves, you know, sometimes I don't think people commit enough. I mean, I've, I've been working on commitment a lot lately and I've found even just the small waves, just a couple more strokes and you might be surprised. You might actually catch that small wave. Yeah, that's true. And, uh, you know, it's, it's very much in the moment when it's about manoeuvres. And it's, it is an irony because there's, when you're riding a wave, you're wanting yourself to be operating at the highest level of our mental game, which is our intuition, where it's very uh, anticipatory and, and it's, it's kind of almost, well, it is totally in the moment, but it's, it's, we're so aware that we can sense what's going to happen and the body can just move. The body has its own intelligence and can just move. So the commitment's about locking into it, helps you lock into that mindset if you like because then you don't want to be thinking too much through the waves. You can you can see people riding waves and a section comes that they could do a turn on and you see their bottom turns into, their bottom turn becomes two or three stages instead of just that one flowing rail and then up the face into the lip or whatever the manoeuvre potential is. Uh, so that, that commitment, locking that in, before you paddle, as you paddle in, then the mind can just be free to flow intuitively with the performance opportunities and demands of the wave. Okay, so being calm, confident and committed is the key to unlocking intuition? I certainly think it's one of the keys, yeah. This is the beautiful thing of the mind. It's kind of, we're always learning and and people discover all sorts of ways to um, create you know, to really cultivate intuition. Um, I've, I've done a lot of work uh, with uh, Olympic sailors and when, you know, out on Sydney Harbour and other places, another way that I've assisted them to develop their intuition for the feel of the water, the feel of the wind, the full sail, uh, those kind of elements of their performance is when you've got a lot of big, clear, open water, so it's very safe, you, you ask them to close their eyes. And the moment you uh, let go of a sense, the other senses heighten. 
and another part because you know our, our mind and body are just absolutely fantastic uh, creations of nature because they're purpose built to adapt moment to moment you know so once you close your eyes then all of a sudden your intuition kicks in because I have to survive and thrive here you know and it's incredible to see these sailors start to get a full sail and be much more subtle in their steering and their movements of uh, all the ropes and how they you know uh, assist their boat to perform because they're doing it through feel not which is more intuitive uh, which is not so much about the, th the thinking process so ideally the thinking process is done in preparation and then it's a feel when it's a performance so ha having uh, confidence in your preparation is definitely going to give rise to more intuitive decisions yeah that's right because what essentially is happening is you're creating best opportunity because it's not certain and in fact a component of being intuitive is that there's spontaneity mm. so if I am too regimented and too rigid with my thinking and preparation and I'm trying to control it and make it happen by default it's not going to happen because my intuitive mind just goes oh well my intellectual mind my cognitions are in charge at the moment I'm going to have a break so it's actually when you open up the space for spontaneity uh, that intuition goes, oh, cool, you need, you need some help, and then sometimes it takes over. So that's where you see people in incredibly intense performance moments, you know, the tennis player blindly diving and somehow getting a winner shot off or, uh, you know, the Formula One racer taking a line on a bend that's just never been taken before. And then, of course, all those moments you see people so deep in the tube, literally riding up through around foam balls and things like that. I mean, that's all got to be by feel because you don't even have time to think. So when you're thinking about preparation for a performance, uh, it's about cultivating the best opportunity to be in that mental state and consistently so. Uh, but, of course, spontaneity has got to be part of that. So we need to allow ourselves to be vulnerable, allow ourselves uh, an element of our performance to not be in our control, but isn't that part of the love of surfing, you know? <laughs> you just yeah. don't know what's going to happen when you take off on a wave and that's why we just take off on wave after wave after wave, you know, because it's so, you know, we're, we're in curious. The child's, the child's mind is just frothing. It's so curious about what's going to happen. Yeah. When you were um, working with the, with the world tour and obviously you got to meet a lot of um, the best surfers in the world, what are some things that, that you noticed that were very different about them to the general population? Well, the things that I noticed, and not just on the surf tour, now that I've also done about a dozen games campaigns, summer and winter games, and Paralympics, Olympics and things like that, and I've worked with musicians and dancers, actors, actresses, business people, the people that are operating at a level where they're constantly exploring and discovering and prepared to make errors because they're so sure that they either do have a process or they're going to find the process that unlocks that next level of potential, that next layer of achievement or, or goal achievement. That's, that's certainly something that I see, uh, that I saw amongst the surfers that were really doing well on the tour, that their, their mind was really open to anything's possible. And I'll, I'll never forget um, when Laird towed into the Millennium Wave. We are all in Osegore at the time and, uh, you know, it took a little longer to get to us. Uh, I don't, I, I, there probably was internet then, I can't remember, but I, the, the story flooded through that Laird had ridden this wave that was just beyond, totally beyond what anyone thought was possible. And, and from that moment, you know, the moment we think something's possible, it starts to become possible. Even things like, uh, you know, flying to the moon and, and being able to, um, you know, have Skype calls with people around the world and things like this. It all happens because people start to think it's possible and that's part of a mindset of an elite performer in any domain is that, um, you know, if I, if I can imagine this, then now all I've got to do is work out how to create and deliver it. <laughs> mm. Okay, so, so the elite performers still have that deep yearning to get better. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And um, uh, it's one of the significant challenges that I work with athletes on when they're making that transition into retirement because they're no longer day in, day out stepping onto their performance domain 
where every cell in their body is dancing, where their their love and passion is and has been for many years, and where they're on that projection of continuing to evolve a potential. And it can be, uh, you know, mentally, emotionally, really quite crushing for some people. And so going through that that process with them and then assisting them to find another space uh, where they can feel like they're optimising their potential is, is really, really important and uh, really helps them apply that experiential process they've been in with with their performance to the new domain if uh, you know particularly where most sports are time limited because you can really physically only peak for a certain period of time so this is where you see you know a range of surfers you know like Shane Dorian and guys like that who have transitioned from an elite WCT level surfer to now an elite big wave rider you know it's also where you see people sometimes people transition into other areas of life that they've they've loved anyway like music or something like that and then you know another really profoundly important and beautiful space to uh, evolve as a human is uh, through growing your family you know cultivating a relationship with your partner and, and raising happy healthy kids and the next generation of grommets kind of thing i mean so that all comes down to perspective because yeah a, a day at the beach with your kids might not be like the days you used to have a pipeline <laughs> getting shacked all day in 10 foot pits uh but it, it, in a practical sense but in a felt sense it might even be more profoundly fulfilling when you allow yourself to transition mentally emotionally into that space yeah i guess that comes back to holding on to the past again doesn't it yeah, it can be, and, and, you know, like from birth through the lifespan to death, the body changes. No matter what we do, the body is youthful, it grows, it has an adult phase and it ages and dies. Now, the mind's the same, so it's kind of ironic. It's like trying to uh, resist a natural process. Well, we know what happens in the ocean when we resist natural processes in the ocean, so we need to look at our inner being and our own evolution as a person in the same way. We are our own ocean, you know, we flow and move. <laughs> yeah. You work one-on-one -on -one with people, am I correct? Yeah, I do one-on-one, -on -one, in person, by phone, and, and also by phone and Skype around the world. I do group sessions, everything from board rider clubs to sponsor teams to actual professional teams of athletes, not just surfers, but, you know, I work with footy, rugby, all sorts of different professional sports. And um, I work with any human who is interested to perform better, to understand themselves better or perform better. So I do a lot of professional mentoring now with coaches, with directors and board-level people in companies, with managers. Um, I actually do mentoring with parents on raising kids and how uh, they can be evolving and approach that from a performance psychology perspective, which really cultivates the health, mental health and potential of their kids as well as uh, keeps their sanity, <laughs> which is very important. Yeah. Yeah, so my three main areas are performance psychology, obviously in sport and performance and artistic pursuits and adventure pursuits, so team sports as well, individual and team. And then I do a lot of professional mentoring in the professional setting, whether that's, um, you know, uh, a doctor, a lawyer, a surf coach, anyone in their professional domain. I, I do it for tradies, you know. And then my third area of expertise is really with young minds, with young people, and cultivating mental health, good healthy mental development as well as performance potential. And that's something I do directly with the young person as well as when the parents are interested uh, actually with them on their parenting styles. And I apply performance psychology paradigms to that. For example, the parents, if you like, are the coach, coaching staff, the coaching team, and the kids are the athletes. And so ideally the intention is to be redundant because it's the athletes that perform. In other words, it's the kids that live their life. And our role is to cultivate their potential and instill values, principles, team spirit, if you like, uh, so that when they're out on their own, they're making good decisions. Their psychology is sound. Their thoughts, feelings, actions, and their relationships with self and the world are very sound so that they can uh, not just survive but thrive in whatever performance space, life setting they, they choose to step into or find themselves in. And how do people find out more about you, Richard? Uh, well, every, everyone can simply contact me through my website. I've got two websites. Uh, I started the surfersmind.com 
in 2001, I think, and uh, that's just been a wonderful space to grow my understandings of psychology. Uh, to do that in the sport and lifestyle that I love has just been fantastic and, and it's been a real niche area that actually a lot of the Olympic and Paralympic athletes I've worked with have really actually applied surf psychology. So a lot of them out there, <laughs> when you see them in Rio, are actually coming from a mindset that was born from surfing and surf psychology. Uh, but I, I, my new practice is called Om Psychology. Uh, dot com, and uh, or oh, that's the web. The website is ompsychology.com. O m psychology.com. Mm -hmm. Om being the seed mantra of the universe, because a lot of my practice is drawn, and a lot of my services are drawn from Eastern teachings and ancient wisdom and uh, universal laws of Mother Nature, human nature, along with the Western understanding the scientific understanding of what psychology is and how human experience is, uh, you know, can be transformed from both the Western science as well as the Eastern traditions and wisdoms. And, uh, yeah, so ompsychology.com is where people can find me and that's got, uh, I guess, a little broader, a little bit more broader information about me and my services in terms of those three areas, my performance psychology, my professional mentoring and performance, mindfulness, heartfulness with people in the professional domains and then my work with young minds and young people. And uh, there is also the section there where I, I do transcend, I do transpersonal psychology, which is guiding people's inner evolution from a mindfulness, heartfulness, uh, spiritual perspective as well. All right. Awesome. And I'll put links to both of those websites in the show notes. And I can't, I think every single surfer out there needs a copy of The Surfer's Mind and on their bookshelf. It's such an awesome book and, and resource. So you can get a copy of that from thesurfersmind.com as well. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Richard. But before you go, I've got a, a quick fire four questions. What's your favorite surfboard at the moment? <laughs> I'm all out of boards. That's why I just picked up a new one yesterday. It's a 6 Morris Cole. And I am frothing to put some fins in it and take it surfing. I'm sure it's going to be my latest favorite board. <laughs> okay, awesome. Refining things down to that magic board. Yeah. Okay. And who's your favorite surfer? Oh, probably my brother. My brother got me into surfing. I just love sharing waves with him. It's yeah. so much fun. Yeah. Okay, favorite professional surfer? Ah, oh, <laughs> you know, I really couldn't name one and... I really couldn't name one, you know. If you asked me when I was 10 years old, I'd yeah. probably have an answer. <laughs> but now that I've had just the dream of meeting lots of the surfers that uh, I, I really admire and uh, and not just in competitive surfing, you know, there's, uh, I was so fortunate to meet people like Peter Cole and Clyde Ocow and, and um, you know, Derek Doner and guys like that through my travels and work in surf psychology around the world that... Um, yeah, it's. Uh, I can't choose one. I love all. I love everything everyone gives to surfing. You know. Okay. Do you have a favourite surfing vid or surf film? <laughs> For comedy, uh, I think you still can't go past Mad Wax. <laughs> I remember seeing that when I was a grommet, and that was that was fantastic. Uh, yeah. Okay. Cool. And do do you have a favourite pre-surf song or album? Oh, I wouldn't say favourite, but I would definitely say I love music and, and I tend to play around with what music I might listen to before before a surf. Yep. And in general it's it's some pretty mellow stuff when it's when it might be quite uh, you know, quite big or quite challenging and intense because I just find that uh, mellow music is it's a very natural way to have that inner part of my being nice and calm and peaceful because the adrenaline's going to come, so um, you know I yeah. don't need to already be adrenalised on the sand. Uh, and then sometimes, you know, when it's one of those cold onshore days, not too much waves, and it's more about, well, I'm just going to have a party in the ocean, whatever it delivers, you know. Well, then yeah, I might uh, listen to some music that's a bit more fired up. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I would say I'm, I'm still stuck with Floyd and Santana and Hendrix and all those musicians I listened to when I was a grommet because. Uh, They've got the whole range of that style, and yeah, it's just for me, it's just seems still is music that resonates so deeply. Yeah, timeless albums you've mentioned there, yeah, and artists. Okay, uh, again, Richard, uh, thank you so much for your time, really appreciate it, as I'm sure the listeners do as well. 
And I just urge everyone to go and check Richard's website out and, and get a copy of that book. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, Mike. I really, really appreciate the opportunity to um, share with you through your Surf Mastery podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to the Surf Mastery podcast. Again, I'm your host, Michael Frampton. Make sure you subscribe so you can keep up to date with the latest interviews. Please share with your friends. Check us out uh, on Facebook at uh, Surf Mastery Surf. And if you're on iTunes, please go and give us a little rating. That'd be awesome. Until next time, keep surfing.